A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once to your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, for they have become depraved. They have soon turned aside from the way I pointed out to them, making for themselves a molten calf and worshiping it, sacrificing to it, and crying out, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I see how stiff-necked this people is, continued the Lord to Moses. Let me alone then that my wrath may blaze up against them to consume them. Then I will make of you a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God, saying, Why, O Lord, should your wrath blaze up against your own people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with such great power and with so strong a hand? Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and how you swore to them by your own self, saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and all this land that I promised, I will give your descendants as their perpetual heritage. So the Lord relented in the punishment he had threatened to inflict on his people. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to Timothy. Beloved, I am grateful to him who has strengthened me, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he considered me trustworthy in appointing me to the ministry. I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and arrogant, but I have been mercifully treated because I acted out of ignorance in my unbelief. Indeed, the grace of our Lord has been abundant, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of these, I am the foremost, but for that reason I was mercifully treated, so that in me, as the foremost, Christ Jesus might display all his patience as an example for those who would come to believe in him for everlasting life. To the King of ages, incorruptible, invisible, the only God, honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to Jesus to listen. But the Pharisees and the scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them, Jesus addressed this parable. What man among you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, would not leave the ninety-nine in the desert and go after the lost one until he finds it? And when he does find it, he sets it on his shoulders with great joy. And upon his arrival home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, and he says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, In just the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over the one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. Or what woman, having ten coins and losing one, would not light a lamp and sweep the house, searching carefully until she finds it? And when she does find it, she calls together her friends and her neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me. 
because I have found the coin that I lost. In just the same way, I tell you, there will be more rejoicing among the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The Gospel of the Lord. All right, so at the time of this conversation, Ken was just north of 90 and Clarence was just approaching 90. Both of them had been um, widowers for many decades. They both lost their wives very young, never remarried, had confirmed bachelor existence, and used to go out to coffee after Mass a lot on weekday mornings. And then sometimes on Saturday, they would twist my arm after Mass. This is back when I was in Wisconsin at St. Albert's Parish. And Ken and Clarence and I would go down to the Prairie Diner with the very uh, efficient waitress. (laughs) Just before your rear end hit the seat, it, just, it, it, it was like she had the menus in front of you wanted to know what you want. You know, it was one of those kind of places. It was terrific. So the conversation unfolded that Ken was saying he had just been to his grandniece's wedding. And Ken grew up in a place, he grew up in Madison, which is kind of an unusual place. And before he got to Madison, he was out in this little town called Spring Green. Spring Green is, as he said, it's, it's nothing but granola people out there. So Spring Green was kind of like a hippie place, you know. And when his daughter was married, she got married in a, her daughter, his grandniece was married in a cornfield outside of Spring Green. So the conversation was, they made up their own vows. And Clarence said, and Clarence was sort of the more subdued one, and Ken's the more sort of big mouth. And Clarence said, well, that's, that sounds nice. Did the priest let them do that? Oh no, there was no priest. It was a granola wedding in a cornfield. Well, did they use Catholic vows? They're a very nice young couple. Maybe they used Catholic vows. Oh no, they did some stuff I'd never heard of before. I didn't even know. I had to look up half the words they said. Oh, that's interesting, Clarence said. Well, you know, maybe we could, there's room for a little alteration in our wedding vows too. And Ken doesn't doesn't miss a beat. He said, you know, I was thinking about that when I heard the granola vows, he said. You know, my wife put up with me a lot. And it is as if when we were married all those years, She had taken a vow that said, I take you for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, and when you're rational and when you're irrational. That's what she really almost said because she put up with me when I was rational and when I was irrational. Note to file, huh? That's right. That's how it works. That we have these people in our lives that whether we're on the straight now or on the rails or, you know, the wheels are on the wagon or whether you know, we're a little bit unhinged or getting a little bit steamed up about something. Ken used to, remember the archi- architect Frank Lloyd Wright? Frank Lloyd Wright was a big famous architect back in the last century. Ken was, he ran the liquor store in the town and Frank Lloyd Wright was always getting lots and lots of coverage in the paper about how all these great accomplishments and what he was doing and Ken would be going to a tailspin because Frank Lloyd Wright had not paid his bill at the liquor store in town. How does he get to be so famous? And he's seven months behind on his scotch bill. This is not fair. And he would go off and he said he would go into a tirade that would last for two or three days. And his wife would just wait him out and take him back and, you know, onto the next tirade. But that's right. You have people in your life, I have people in mine. That when I'm rational, they'll be good and stay around. And even when I'm irrational, they're not going to head for the hills. Like Mrs. McCarville. And that all opens us up to just the littlest image of God's fidelity when we are irrational. And so this week, next week, the last week in September, as we look at this question of what does it mean to be rational, let's start off clarifying. Even when we are irrational, God sticks with us, and God's always trying to restore us to rationality and lift us up. But what do we as Catholics mean by rationality? It's not the same thing exactly that Ken meant, when he talked about him flying off the handle. As Catholics, we come at this from the tradition of, well, especially as I understand it, St. Augustine back in the year, what, 500 and something? St. Anselm at the turn of the millennium, St. Thomas Aquinas, up just a little bit after that, the triple A, huh? Anselm, Augustine, Aquinas. And what comes to us is this. Human beings are rational when they do three things. They know the goal that they're trying to achieve. They know the means for achieving that goal. And they choose the means that get them to that goal. Okay? Three things to be rational. Know the goal. 
Know the means, choose the right means. If you want to get to New York, that's your goal. The options are, well, I could drive, I could take the bus, I suppose I could ride my bike, I could take the train. Okay, these are all the different means. And then let's say you go down to the train station at Rutgers and you get on the train southbound, going to Philly. Are you being rational or irrational? Irrational. There's your goal, here's how you do it, and you're, you're, you're not pursuing the means in the appropriate way. I'm not suggesting for you Eagles fans that every time someone goes to Philadelphia they're being irrational. I'm just saying that in this case, that's an instance of being irrational. We know, as Christians, that we have built into us this desire for our goal. Our goal is heaven. And on earth, the goal that we all have in our hearts, that our guts keep telling us, and that little trustworthy voice says, what you're seeking is true happiness. That's our goal. Every one of us, we doll it up in all sorts of different ways, but that's the thing we seek, is true happiness. We know that as Christians, the only true happiness is the happiness that aligns with Christ's love and Christ's hopes. We can call it happiness, but we know it's not. So we're going in search of this thing, as St. Um, uh, Bonaventure would say, our hearts are made for thee, O Lord, and they shall not rest until they rest in thee. Our hearts are programmed for being happy in connection with God. Every once in a while we get really goofy and we head off in different directions, pursuing some happiness that has nothing to do with Christ's hope or Christ's love. We become completely irrational. It's not all the time. It's, it's rare. It's infrequent. But we do have those moments when we're trying to pursue happiness, but what we do is not pursue the happiness that's true happiness. We get distracted. And when we do, God calls us back, challenges us, and it's not just some big fairy tale. It's the story in the readings, and it's the story in your life and in my life. In the first reading today, it's the story of the children of Israel becoming irrational and God bringing them back to rationality. The children of Israel are leaving Egypt, and what's their destination? What's their goal? They know what it is. You know what it is. What's the goal for the children of Israel? Where are they trying to go? Get back home. Get to the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. How do they get there? Follow Moses' directions. Do what Moses says. Today we get the passage. They want to get to the land flowing with milk and honey. Moses goes up the mountain. He stays a little bit longer than they had expected. They hit the panic button, and they start to worship a golden calf that they've made. That's completely irrational. And Moses comes down the mountain, and then the Lord is furious with the people of Israel. And the Lord says, I think I've had enough of them, Moses. I'm not quite sure, but I think this is the last straw. And Moses talks God out of it. Right? God does that all the time. God says, okay, Moses, let's get them to their goal. Let's get them to that true happiness. Let's get them to the promised land. Let's reboot. Let's start this thing over again. Even when they became irrational, God said, you know, I still love you. You're really bugging me, but I'm going to work with you. Let's get you back on track. Paul looks back on the period of his own irrationality before the Damascus Road experience. Paul was in pursuit of true happiness just like you pursue it and I pursue it. Paul's pursuing true happiness, but he's got it all dressed up thinking the best way to be happy is to destroy this Christian religion. Well, that doesn't line up with God's hopes. And God finally got that message through to Paul on the Damascus Road. Paul, you can keep doing that for as long as you want. You're never going to be happy. Paul, why are you doing this? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Paul has that great big experience and redefines what it is to be truly happy. And he pursues it as an apostle of Christ rather than as an opponent of Christ. So he gives up his harebrained notion of what it means to be happy and how he's going to get there. It takes on this whole new thing, and he regains his rationality. And he says three different ways in today's second reading. The Lord was merciful toward me. I was blasphemous, I was a persecutor, and I was arrogant. Three times he says, the Lord was merciful to me, the Lord brought me back. That's what God does when we become irrational. Never fails. There's always that voice that says, come on back. In the gospel today, we get two experiences, two incidents, or two examples of the irrational people. The gospel today starts off with the mention of sinners and tax collectors. Now talk about irrational. Why would you become a tax collector for the good life? Wait, what you really want, Mr. Tax Collector, is to be happy. 
But what you're doing is making everybody your worst enemy and your life is miserable. Right? You might have a couple of extra shekels, but you can't stand coming into town and they all can't stand you. You're miserable, Mr. Tax Collector. And what does Jesus do? Does Jesus take the same approach as the scribes and the Pharisees and say, stay away from that irrational person? <laughs> Jesus says, you know what? Let's get together for dinner. I'd like to talk to you. I'd like to throw some new ideas in your direction about what it might mean to be truly happy. And the same thing with the sinners. And by the way, yes, think it through. Every sin is an irrational act. But not every irrational act is a sin. You got it? Every sin is an irrational act, but not every irrational act is a sin. So we talk about sinners and tax collectors, and then Jesus gives us the metaphor of the sheep wandering off from the rest of the pack, seeking happiness in the crags and far away. It's never going to happen, poor little Dumbo sheep. And we do have to wonder about what happened to the other 99 when the, when the farmer goes off, the shepherd goes off looking for this one, huh? Grabs it up by the back of the neck, puts it over his shoulders, drags it on back. Even there, there Mr. Silly Sheep, I'm bringing you back where you belong. You're not going to find happiness apart from this flock or apart from me. So come on, let's get back home where you belong. That's what God does all the time. But here's the question. This story is undoubtedly your story and my story. The story of people becoming irrational and God bringing them back to rationality so that they can find true peace in this life and happiness with God forever in the next. It never fails. And we get enough irrational pursuits that we know we're going to have a few more. But how does the Lord's voice work in your life? And it depends on the kind of irrationality that we pursue. And there's lots and lots written about this, but the way the Lord responds activates that voice in us. You see, for the children of Israel, they had Moses speaking for God. Get back to where you go and, you know, head for true happiness. None of this golden cow stuff. And with Paul, it was the Damascus Road. And with the sheep, it was the shepherd and the Pharisees, or rather the tax collectors. And the sinners had Jesus. But what that happens to us, how does it happen to you? For some people, as St. Ignatius says, it's like water dropping onto a sponge. It's a very gentle process that says, you know what, you're going in the wrong direction. You're not going to find happiness out there. For other people, it's like a torrent against a rock. It's this crashing, violent thing. And we know it. We've had that experience, too, of, oh, my gosh, this is, what did I do? You know, let me change my ways. It depends on the form of irrationality and on your own salvation history. But I'd ask you this. Can you name two or three times in your own life when you've fallen into irrationality? When you've gone off in pursuit of a happiness that doesn't line up with Christ's hopes, and so it can't make you happy. It can be in relationships. It can be in the way we approach schoolwork. It can be in the way we live out our prayer life. It can be at work. It can be in our financial management or who knows what it is. That we fall for these pathetic consolations that don't lead to true happiness. And then that voice reminds us, oops. Now, friends, we can get as many voices as we want from the outside, but they don't matter until that voice goes off on the inside. You know that, I know that. How does that voice work in your experience? Can you name two or three times when it has said to you loud and clear, this isn't it, and you said, you're right. And that voice telling you to go in the other direction is exactly the voice that was heard by the people of Israel, by Paul, by the sinners and the tax collectors. It's the voice of the Jesus who never, ever, ever gives up on any one of us, ever, ever. In fact, one could say, he's more faithful to us when we are irrational than Mrs. McCarville ever was to Ken. What's been your experience of this? And who just maybe who out there needs to know that this story has been your story? And it's a beautiful story. And you're here to tell it.
What is your story of that voice turning you back to rationality? And who might need to hear it? So, each one of us, we can look around the world and see moments of extreme irrationality in our neighborhoods, in our state, in our country, but we can also see it in the mirror, a person who sometimes is prone to becoming irrational, that is, pursuing a good that's not really a good, pursuing happiness that's not really happiness. We do it. We've been doing it since Adam and Eve ate the apple, huh? What's your experience of God calling you back to rationality? That voice that goes off that says, you know what, this really isn't cool, or that would be much better, or that seems to line up with what I'm about as a Christian. God's voice takes so many different forms. Can you name two or three times when, yeah, looking back, you can really see the Lord was there to push you back, to give you a better aim and a higher hope and a more realistic pursuit of happiness, true happiness. How did that work? Who might need to hear it? And as they say in Millstone, have a rational week. Let us pray.